recording on. Perfect. So I am very pleased to introduce our guest speaker for tonight, John Mecklin. Uh, John is the editor-in-chief of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists and was previously the editor-in-chief of Miller McCune, the editor of High Country News, and the consulting editor or consulting executive editor for the launch of Key West. He was also an investigative reporter at the Houston Post and covered the Persian Gulf War from Saudi Arabia and Iraq. So I hope everybody will join me tonight in welcoming John Mecklin. It's good, good to see you all and we're going to play with technology now. So just let me see if I can actually share my screen. Is this sharing now? Yep. Can you good. all see that? Good. Uh, this is me. This is, uh, I will, and I think Austin has a link to this, so you all don't have to write anything down. You can just look at this deck, you know, anytime after this. It's, it's not proprietary or anything. Those are my various contacts and whatever in the the actual main value to you of sitting through this is these contacts. You now have the ability to directly access the editor of the bulletin, putting you steps ahead of anybody else. If you want to have something you want to publish there, want to just see if something you're working on is worth writing about for the bulletin, you can just email me or, you know, whatever, and we'll go from there. So, okay, what I'm going to do is tell you, I mean, there, there is no way to tell somebody how to tell a story. There is no one way to tell a story. But I'm going to tell you the way to tell a story anyway, because, you know, that's kind of what I do. And uh, I think my, you will see this uh, t-shirt here. Being a writer, writing is easy. It's like riding a bike, except the bike's on fire, you're on fire, everything is on fire, and you're in hell. No, actually, writing is very hard. I'm going to try to make it easier for you. Uh, this is another way of putting it. Hemingway, one of my favorite writers. There's nothing to writing. All you do is sit down at a typewriter and bleed. Uh, but it's not actually this hard. And what I'm going to try to teach you here in about 20 or 30 minutes is there's a difference between the things you've written up till now, things for academic purposes, whether that's academic journals or your classwork or whatever, and writing for a general audience. And if you think about it, it's, it's, it should come as an interesting fact to you that almost everything you've ever written, somebody was required to read. You know that? You know, your teachers, you know, your parents, whatever. Somebody had to read it, publish in an academic journal. People aren't going to that to read it for the pure joy of reading an academic journal. They want to access the information you're providing. On the other hand, for something like the Bulletin, the Bulletin is a magazine. It's, you know, slightly wonkier than you know, some magazines, but we aim to be very much like uh, the New Yorker or the Atlantic, uh, the New York Times Sunday Magazine. That's what we're aiming for is that conversational way of interacting with a large audience, you know, people who aren't experts in your field. And so that's one main way in which the way you've been writing is different than the way you would write for the bulletin or for a general audience. It's the purpose. When you're writing for, say, a, a research journal, you are strictly trying to convey information. And often, you know, exactly, you know, there's sort of a formatted way you do it. And it's just throw the information over there because people want it, they need it, and they will, you know, you, you don't need to you know, entrance them necessarily. 
for when you publish for a general audience, you you have information. There's important information you want to convey, but you have to interest people too. The a story is like two components. It's like an equation. This should, you know, work for this audience. It's like how important is it, and how interesting is it? You multiply those together, and that's how good the story is. So that interest value has to be there and how you interest people is i will in the language and structure part of this explain that but you should just understand at the start when you write for a general audience they don't have to read it they can put it down whenever they want and as soon as you bore them they will so you can never be just here, eat your Wheaties. Here's a bunch of information I think is important. You always have to be thinking about keeping their interest as you feed them the important information. And so that gets to the second point here, that the intended reader. You know, for an academic journal or research journal, the intended reader is people in your field, generally, you know, people who need that information to do their job. And they are, in a sense, assigned to it. They have to read it. They need that information. Uh, the intended reader for the bulletin, we have a, a large expert readership. You know, just about everybody who's anybody in the nuclear field, whether it's, you know, on the military or on the commercial side, whatever, at some time or another, reads the bulletin, accesses it, and whatever. So that's an audience of ours. But we have a many 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 times larger general audience we reach somewhere in the 400,000 people a month range which doesn't make us huge for a publication but those 400,000 people most of them are not expert in our field most of them are reading it because they're smart they're interested they want to save the world you know but they also expect you know, a little bit of entertainment, a little bit of honey as they swallow their granola. So we address both the expert and a general audience together trying to get them to influence the people in power to do good things, to not have nuclear wars, not, you know, in the world, to do something about climate change, to rein in a whole bunch of disruptive technologies that are emerging now that could be existential in their scope. You know, whether that's CRISPR or, you know, the gene editing technique or uh, higher and higher levels of, uh, you know, computer data, artificial intelligence kind of things. Um, so now, so how is it that you keep the interest of both an expert audience and a general audience and it's it's not easy it's but the, it's it's learnable so one of the ways is with the language itself you'll notice there's a difference if you read most academic journals they are very flat they could they are flat as a pancake there is very little attention paid to the music of the language at all. And to the extent, I mean, in some senses, I know because I've dealt in this area a long time, I mean, people in scientific PhD programs are, I don't think consciously, but unconsciously taught to write flatly, flat sentences, not to be emotional ever, to write in the passive voice to say that the man was bitten by the dog rather than the dog bit the man. And these are things that they convey a, a sense of, I'm not making unwarranted judgments. I'm a scientist who isn't leaping to conclusions. I'm being very careful in what I'm saying here. And that is perfectly appropriate to your research journal. It is absolutely inappropriate to getting anybody else to pay attention to what you have to say. 
So if you want to reach anybody outside your field, you cannot write in that flat, backward, boring way. So I'm going to read this to you because I think when I read it, you get more of what I'm trying to convey than me talking at you. This sentence has five words. Here are five more words. Five word sentences are fine, but several together become monotonous. Listen to what is happening. The writing is getting boring. The sound of it drones. It's like a stuck record. The ear demands some variety. Now listen. I vary the sentence length and I create music. Music. The writing sings. It has a pleasant rhythm, a lilt, a harmony. I use short sentences and I use sentences of medium length. And sometimes when I am certain the reader is rested, I will engage him with a sentence of considerable length, a sentence that burns with energy and builds with all the impetus of a crescendo, the roll of the drums, the crash of the cymbals, sounds that say, listen to this, it is important. And when you pay attention, when you listen to your language, you can have those effects on your readers. But you have to remember that fine writing grows out of an oral tradition. What sounds good when you speak, those, you know, the changes in tone, changes of rhythms, the people you know who are fascinating storytellers when you go out and have a drink with them and they entrance you with their stories of daring do and whatever. They naturally get this idea of changing of tones, changing of rhythms, changing of sentence length and whatever to keep people's attention. So at this point, all I'm trying to do is make you aware, well, as you write, you should be paying attention to that too. That that not boring people with writing flat as pancake sentences that all are about the same length and written in passive voice, not doing that will help your readers and they won't just turn you off. Okay, so that's a really quick going through, you know, some of the language part of interesting readers. There is no way to write a story. I started with this. There is no set of rules. Here's how you write a story, a good story. But I'm going to give you the rules for writing a good story anyway, because this is sort of a superstructure, you know, uh, you know, a scaffolding on which you can hang a story. You can start here and know that you're not making the most elementary mistakes in boring the heck out of your readers. If you'll notice in an academic journal, a research journal, what's, what's the first section often? The first section is often a long, boring recitation of background. Nothing new. It's just like paragraph after paragraph after paragraph of everything you already knew if you're in the field, right? This is, you know, what you all already know. You know, you, you got to read through sometimes seems like miles of text before you get, well, what, what the hell are you trying to tell me here? It's exactly the opposite when you're writing for a general audience. From the very start, you've got to drag them into the story by their lapels. You just got to grab them and go, you want to read this. And so that opening, the first sentence or two or three or four of your story is absolutely the most important. And there are many ways you can open a story to make people pay attention. You know, a common way is to tell a little anecdote, a little story. You know, a you are there. You were there on the campus of UC Berkeley watching somebody do X, Y, Z, you know, or, you know, a little bit of dialogue between two people, or just a really good quote, a really interesting description of, of the scene sometimes. But that first, when they first start reading your story, if you don't grab them in that first graph, first paragraph or two or three, 
they just quit. They won't leave you. So, you, you know, it's like rearranging your head. It's sort of backwards from academic writing and you have to pay special attention to that opening. And once you've grabbed them, you must, 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 what we call in journalese, journalismese, have a nut paragraph. You must write up top. It's often at the end of, you know, you have this opening and then you end the first section with a paragraph or maybe two that says, this is what I'm going to tell you in the rest of this story. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. And I'm going to do it in great compression, hopefully in a very snappy way that really piques your interest. It sort of sets up what they call narrative drive. It's telling people, look, if you keep reading beyond this, you're going to find out all this really cool stuff. I'm not going to tell it all to you. I'm going to hold little bits of it back for the mystery. You know, you're going to have to go find that out. But it's really, what's coming is really cool. And, and you need to keep reading. So that opening in a nut graph, or if you don't have that somewhere at the top of your story, you got to be a really talented storyteller to keep interest. You know, and I'm, since I'm sort of teaching, starting from zero here, I tell almost every time if you're trying to write a story for public uh, consumption, these two things are exceedingly important. After you do that, then you can go back to the very beginning of your story and set the context. Here in my little outline here, I call that the deep history, but you know, it's like if you were writing a story about Abraham Lincoln, when you're going back to the deep history, you go, Abraham Lincoln was born in this log cabin that he was, his parents built for him in Southern Indiana, blah, blah, blah. And then usually chronologically, you would tell your story, the, the deep history, the, the background, the context of your story. And that can be one section, sometimes it's two or three because different stories, the background, the context is more or less interesting. But that's the time you give the context. You don't, as often happens in research articles, you don't do that at the top of the story because people just go, well, they quit, they go away. So after you've set the context of the story, You've opened it. You've told people why they should keep reading it. You've set the context that tells people, and this is why it's important. It's the world in which it's, you know, set. Then you go back, your nut paragraph, you explain it in more detail. You know, your nut paragraph is really a paragraph, maybe two. It's very condensed. You're telling people, if you keep reading this story, run across all this wonderful stuff. This, after you do the deep history, is when you come back, and usually in the order you introduced it in the nut paragraph, explain to people what it is you found, what it is you're talking about. You tell, actually tell your story in some detail here. And that, so they have been sort of wheedled into doing this. You know, you've grabbed them right from the start. You've given them a reason to keep reading. You've written the history of this in a very compelling way and not wasted anybody's time with anything they don't need. And then you can tell the story and they're all set up for it. They're just dying, waiting to read what you have to say. And then when you get done with that, your opening of the story is usually your best what is called in the business material. You know, the best little anecdote you've run across, the most interesting thing somebody said about it, the best scene, whatever. For the finish of your story, you have at, at the top, when you're thinking about how to tell your story, you've put in your back pocket your second best piece of money. You have kept it there warming your backside so that when you come to the end of this story, you can pull it out and use another really interesting, hopefully 
fascinating, surprising something, piece of humor or color or scene or dialogue or whatever to end the story with in a way that references back to the top of your story. It references what you said in your nut graph back so that people go, oh, that's why I read this story. Yeah, it's like it, it was all arguing toward this last little thing. And, you know, and hopefully if you do it right enough, if you write what's called the kicker in a way that really kicks, people will be thinking about your story, not just for the rest of the day. If you write it well enough, weeks and months from then, they will go, God, yeah, you remember that story that had this in it? This is how you people remember the important, interesting thing you have just told them. So the opening is the most important bit, but how you end a story is also really, really vital. So that is my quickie structure of a story. And, you know, I will be a little risque here and I will try to be not too risque. Okay, Newsweek, the old Newsweek when it was a, you know, a real news magazine, it's devolved a little bit now, but back in the days when working at Newsweek was a big deal, they would uh, teach their new people, their new writers, their new interns and whatever, this basic structure of a story, only they use different terminology. For the opening, what I've told you the opening, they said, flash and that included both the opening and the nut paragraph for the deep history that they, they said understanding it was flash understanding the exposition part of it they called clarification and then the kicker they called the kicker and you all can tell what those letters spell out and that's how they got people to remember how to tell a story. So, uh, you know, if you can't remember my way, you know, maybe that one will stick with you. Uh, all right. Now, since I know that almost nobody does pre-reading on stuff like this, because I don't when I go to a Zoom meeting or whatever, you should read the story. This is a classic magazine story. It's not just kind of a good one. It is like a great story about Frank Sinatra. And the fun thing about it is you'll read it, you'll notice that Gay Talese never even got to talk to Frank Sinatra. And he wrote this story that is famous in the world. And it's really fascinating. It's just, you know, why it's so important to Frank Sinatra, why he's just completely torn apart because he's caught a cold. It's, uh, it's worth your time and, uh, I recommend it. I, uh, this I haven't read for a long time, but you know, it's a story about someone who got hit by lightning and it is riveting all the way through. And you can, you know, this general scaffolding that I, I gave you for how you tell a story, pay attention in both the Frank Sinatra piece and this, if you get time to read it, you can see even people, I mean, Gay Talese is famous as a magazine writer, and he knows all the tricks of the trade and stuff, but you will see how those basic schematics, how they map onto these stories. Uh, okay, this I'm gonna run through very quickly because this is, it doesn't apply to me at the bulletin because you have something you want to write for the bulletin. All you do is have to email me and go, hey, John, I think I might write, want to write about this, you know, in a paragraph of saying that, and we can email back and forth and decide whether that works or not. This is a more, in general, if there are other publications you want, you want to write for general publication and say, you want to try to write for foreign policy, the Atlantic or whatever, there is, a general format of writing what they call a query letter that 
nowadays with email and everything, it's not so burned into you know newspaper and magazine editors' brains that you know a, a pitch, a query letter must be exactly this. But you'll be surprised that a lot of people it is you know if you don't approximately have these elements and present them you know very tight and well written way because magazine editors look at so many story pitches if you don't do this they will just immediately just they will you know just form reject you and whatever so you know obviously and the first thing is you know it's always better to go through if you know somebody who knows somebody but whether you do or not or don't you will have this deck you can go and read this article by the person at Writer's Digest that gives an idea, here's how you write uh, a query letter, a pitch, and they will have, if I remember right, five or six different sample query letters. And I would, you know, if you really want to, you know, and I, I hope some of you do want to, you know, I mean, you're at the starts of your careers and it's important that you write for an academic audience and that's good. It's also, if you have that interest, it's also really cool to, be, you know, begin to become a public intellectual. You know, you all are going to go and rule the world in your field anyway, but it's also cool if as you come to immense uh, positions of power and, you know, ride herd over vast armies of people who serve you, it's also nice if you can write for publications you know like the atlantic or the new york times or whatever that reach millions of people so that the important things you know get more generally out there so that what you care about that good things happen actually do uh, so that's my pitch for why at least those of you who have a general interest in that should go ahead and follow it up, you know, not, not to the, you know, exclusion of doing what you need to succeed in your field, but it's important. We particularly need younger people doing that. And the bulletin has a longstanding commitment through something we call the Voices of Tomorrow program of, you know, people in PhD programs, early career postdocs of working with these people with senior faculty who help them sometimes, but you know, working with people to get really, really quality articles published that you will be proud of, it helps the bulletin. So we are particularly interested in that if you are. This is, I gave one of these talks once, at, I think it was the University of Chicago, and one of the people that attended was a nurse who drew her version of science communication was to draw cartoons about science communication. So she did this about me, which I thought was cool. And it's, I always use it to end my talks because it uh, sort of quickly encapsulates what I just said, except I didn't get to the point until now to talk about acronyms. So let me take a minute to counsel you about acronyms. In your field, in your academic journals, you can use all the acronyms you want. If it makes you happy, just litter your writing with acronyms. But all readers, even though the academic ones, even though they say it differently, all readers hate acronyms. Acronyms are tiny poisonous ants that bite readers on the eyes. You should never use acronyms. Anything more complicated than FBI or CIA, don't do it. And certainly don't do it if you send something to the bulletin. Because I will just, as it says, I'm tired of crossing out acronyms, and I am. But I will just cross out all of yours, because they're not going in the bulletin, because people don't like them. And, and you, 
there's a reason. I mean, it's an actual physical reaction. When you see a body of texts that's littered with these capitalized JCPOAs and everything that most people don't know what they mean, and there are three or four of them, and they're crawling all over the page there, it physically repulses people. They are certain to quit reading what you've written if you put too many in. So that's my pitch for, please, lay off the acronyms. And uh, with that, that's, that's pretty much, you know, the end of my presentation, but I would uh, be happy to answer questions. I don't know how you all do this.